Hey, welcome back to The Big Pivot. I'm Nigel over there. I've got Brad. But more importantly, with us today, we have Harriet Messenger from Husk Distillers. Hello. Hello. How are you doing? Thanks for joining us. Oh, thank you for having me on this chilly June day. Well, for you to say that, because you're right up the top of New South Wales. Is it yeah, we're big wimps up here. Yeah, it gets drops below 20 degrees and we all start whinging. So it's freezing. <laughs> Whereas Brad, look at him, rugged up in his down jacket in his house. Yeah, I'm freezing. Hey, now listen, you, um, you obviously uh, husk distillers. You're a, a distillery. Tell us a little bit about what you do. But more importantly, when COVID hit, you kind of changed your business model a tad. Just tell us a little bit about what went on. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so we're a distillery. So we make ink gin as well as um, craft rum. And we actually started with a kind of vision to pioneer a new style of Australian rum and create a new rum drinking culture, um, being a culture of appreciation, more similar to that, what we're used to, how we're used to drinking whiskey. We wanted to bring that over to Mm. rum because rum is a very misunderstood um, spirit. (laughs) And I've actually, I've actually had not a lot, but, some of your rum and it's yeah it's it's very nice a healthy amount good 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 um so yeah so we have a farm in the northern rivers because to make rum you can either make it with molasses or you can make Mm -hmm. it with sugar cane being from where we are in the world northern new south wales we can grow sugar cane so we wanted to make this quite unique french style agricole rum and so we have this farm we've got a production facility we've got a distillery bottling room um and things have been going pretty well we opened up a cellar door about a year ago well not quite a year ago and then when coronavirus when the pandemic hit the cellar door got shut down and our five permanent front of house staff so our chef our major d our venue manager and bar manager tour coordinator they were all out of a job suddenly we did not fire them we didn't make them redundant because our mission at the start of that we had our first crisis meeting and we said Um, Well, dad, West family business, so dad CEO, and he said, um, our primary objective to get through these few months is to keep people, skills, um, and and cash. So they're the three the three primary things. And we managed to now that we're coming out of it, we have managed to retain all of our people, which is fantastic. All our permanent full time staff, but it was a really weird first couple of weeks because it was surreal. We were just kind of as it was for everybody throwing your whole business model out the window and just kind of being open to what opportunities might come up and, you know, a few sleepless nights and putting together uh, crisis management plans and that sort of thing. We're lucky that we do have a diversified business. So immediately we put all of our um, permanent staff on the bottling line. So Mm -hmm. um, they started bottling gin and they started doing bits and pieces around the farm. I don't know if you guys have any experience in managing property, but farms are endless time sucks. So it's yeah. always I, I, I live on one. So yeah. Oh, you, live on, you know yeah. exactly. Yeah. There's a pandemic. What pandemic is always fencing <laughs> and all these things to do. Yeah. The work, the work keeps going. The money just stops. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, exactly. The time and money sucks. That's, that's mm-hmm. what they are. Um, and yeah, we were just kind of open to things as they were coming up. And one thing that we saw happening in the U S and we kept seeing it over a couple of days and this all happened within a week. We saw uh, distilleries over there starting to make sanitizer and it was in response to a shortage of sanitizer because poor sanitizer, normal sanitizer companies went from being, you know, a random thing that people occasionally use or they might use by when they're going off to India or something. Suddenly everybody needed it. So there was a huge gap there, um, supply demand gap. And we thought, oh, that's interesting because we can make sanitizer. We have all the facilities on our farm. We've got the still, we can make ethanol and we've got the production facilities and we've got the bottling line and we've got the people. So it took us a couple of days to sort of process that complete shift. It was a complete shift from spirits to sanitizer, something that you want to drink and should drink to something that is absolutely not for drinking and for your hands. So it was a bit of a, a bit of a shift. But eventually we thought, okay, we've got to do this. This is, this is such that, and there was a need for it. That was the other thing. We weren't going to do it if there wasn't a need, but we started getting emails from schools, from the police service, from the fireies, from all these different um, public services, which I was quite surprised at um, saying, we need sanitizer. Can you give us some ethanol? So we thought, yep. (laughs) And off we went. Wow. Yeah. 
you need a, was there a recipe that you had to follow and, and any um, uh, requirements, you know, creating the, the, the stuff? Or? Yeah, it's that. So, and that was another whole learning process, I suppose, because it is, there's, very, there's a whole the governing body governing these sorts of things, which is a TGA in Australia, um, Therapeutics Good, Goods Administration. Um, in the light of the pandemic, what they did with the, with the federal government actually was slash, make it so accessible for us to access the information and they slashed red tape. So they basically said, um, if you've got, the government said, if you've got sanitizer, get it out, follow it. Here's the recipe. We've got two recipes. Wow. This is an ethanol based recipe. Wow. Here it is. Get it out there. Um, so that was great. And it was a world health organization recipe, um, that they used. And yeah, off we went. And it's pretty easy stuff to make, honestly. If you can make the ethanol, the sanitizer is the easy part. So there's a heap of questions coming into my mind. But the first one is, so you had to close the cellar door. And by the way, the fact that you, you're very family oriented and kept everybody on is admirable. And I think it's, it says a lot about the business itself. Yeah, they're, um, our, they're our buddies. <laughs> they are which like is, family. That's really lovely to hear. Um, so you close it, but were you still were you still distilling 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 rum at the same time as hand, hand sanitizer? Because obviously it's not just cellar door sales. Or did you completely have to ship? Like, what about the equipment, the resources you had on site? How much did that cut into the rum? Distilling? Mm. Well, the rum because it is the rum's actually a seasonal product. So because we can only make it during the sugarcane harvest, we're not in harvest at the moment. So we're starting harvest uh. in about three or four weeks. So that was good. Um, the if we were in harvest, it would have been a lot more tricky because harvest you've got a six month window. You have to get in, make as much rum as you can, and then you and then the harvest is over. But we were making gin still. So gin we can make year round. We were making gin still during this whole whole um, whole fun couple of months. And that was, that was fine because it did sort of peter off for a while. Um, like, but then the funny thing was that people started panic buying alcohol. And we saw all these panic buying. So we had, we had sanitized. Sorry. I think I was doing that. Oh, exactly. <laughs> I think we all were. You, you look like you still are, by the way. <laughs> Rude. <laughs> Um, no, I think it was like a national thing. I think we can all really relate. We were all buying toilet paper, of course. And then we found a lot of people with panic buying sanitizer and then alcohol, which was great for us because we could do two out of three things. So we were laughing. <laughs> so, so, sorry, Nibs, do you sell um, the majority at the cellar door or do you, do you um, send it to bottle shops and have relationships with um, distributors or...? Mm. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, but initially, initially we were just getting it out the cellar door to our local community. So we, and because we were chasing our tail, like we were everything, we were we were literally bottling it, putting it on a cart, and running it straight out the front door, um, and people were coming and picking it up because people were really desperate for it, and particularly businesses. Lots of businesses had to either close or they had to open. They had to stay open with a COVID safe plan. Mm. So if they didn't have sanitizer, they couldn't stay open and they couldn't find sanitizer anywhere. So initially it was just pumping out to as many local places as we could. And majority of it went out the cellar door. Like we had a little drive through, drive through thing. And we had umbrellas and stations and iPads and contactless things. And it was all a bit crazy. At one point there was cars literally out onto the road blocking traffic. Don't tell Tweed Council. <laughs> well, it's a bit like <laughs> now. <laughs> you just said it. Yeah. But it was, it was madness for, for maybe a week and a half or two weeks. And then it started to stabilize. We got on top of things and we started sending it more broadly. Yeah. Wow. Gosh. What's what's the plan in the future? Because we're now two months almost down the track from from that moment of when you decided to start doing. It. And I've noticed, you know, on your website huskdistillers.com, um, you actually have liquid sanitizer on your website. So does that mean you're going to continue production when all this sort of when we get back to the new normal? The new normal, yeah. Well, I think it will still be on a needs basis. We've gone every day during this, when the first month of the shutdown, every day we had a different mindset and every day something different was, was thrown up. Um, and at one point, Dad said, maybe we should, maybe this could be a permanent line. We could, you know, have this as a permanent product and take it to market. Didn't really excite me. <laughs> it's not as romantic as gin and rum. Um, 
And so I think what, what we're at, where we're at at the moment is we're about to go into rum harvest and during rum harvest, everything just gets turned up to a million because you just have to, it's just such a crazy time. So I think we'll just be needs basis while there's still a need in our local community for sanitizer, we'll, we'll keep making it. But and when that need dries up, I think we'll probably wind it up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Go back to making the stuff you can drink. Yeah. <laughs> so how long's the distillery been going? So we've started up in 2012. Mm -hmm. We made two barrels of rum that year. And mm -hmm. then we didn't sell a single bottle of anything. So we were making rum every year and we were developing the gin recipe from 2012. But we actually, the first bottle we sold wasn't to, until 2015. So there's a bit of a lag with these things. <laughs> yeah. So you had a, you had a, um, uh, a farm and then mum and dad or mum and dad said, why don't we start making um, rum and gin? Is that, is that how it worked? Or? Yeah, it, it's a, well, we actually bought this property that we're living on now. We, we bought this with the explicit purpose of making rum. Mm -hmm. And it was definitely dad's crazy hair brain idea that mum was kind enough to put up with and now is, you know, in, you know loves it. But it was a dad's crazy idea to sell the family home in Brisbane and buy this farm and start tinkering around in the old farm shed, <laughs> spending 12 hours a day banging around in there, making, trying, trying to set up a distillery, a pilot plant distillery, making rum and gin. Um, so, yeah, the farm, the idea came first, then the farm came as a means to the idea. <laughs> and it was a three year lag from when you, your first bottle to your actual first sale. Was that in the plan or, and if not, what kept you guys going for three years to see the money coming? Because that's a massive lead time. It is. It is. Um, remembering there wasn't a lot of outgo uh, outgoing costs because it was just dad and his shed banging around. Um, yeah. So he was probably quite happy just banging around for three <laughs> yeah. years. Right? Yeah. There was an issue cost in setting, buying the, the original small steel and that sort of thing. Um, but it w that's just how long it takes to make rum. And this is the, the thing that a lot of people don't realize about rum and whiskey. You have to age it for at least two years. When, with us, we're making an agricultural rum. So we have to plant the paddock a year prior. So that's at least three years right there. And we have never released a rum that was two years old. We've always released three plus years old rum. Mm -hmm. So rum and whiskey, you have to age it. And it's just a, it's a patient man's game. Gin is much faster it's unaged gin and vodka unaged you can bump you know pump it out fairly quickly so yeah that's the difference that's why lots of people make gin it's much easier yeah. yeah um i'm interested in the term agricole can you explain agricole you did say it's because you you, you your crop comes from your own land but is it a is it sustainable is it regenerative uh give us a bit more of an insight because i'm really fascinated with that yeah, so agricole is actually the French word. So agricole is a French word for this style of rum they make in the French Caribbean. So broadly speaking, this is rum is there's quite a lot in the rum category that we, um, generally speaking in Australia, have never had access to. So generally speaking, there's two types of rum: molasses rum and sugarcane juice rum. Um, and the sugarcane juice rum, the French have really the French Caribbean guys, so notably Martinique the island of Martinique, they've really taken this style of rum and, and made it a their own. It's their signature style. And the uh, word agricole comes from the word agricultural and it's an agricultural product. Um, so it is, it's fantastic. It's, we, call, we do paddock to bottle. So everything paddock to bottle and we have actually full circle distilling. So we grow our sugar cane. We've got about five or six varieties at any one time and we're experimenting with all different varieties. Um, we process, we harvest cut, crush, ferment, distill all on site. Um, all of our organic waste is either composted um, or, and put back into the property or we feed it to our cattle. So we've got about 40 head of cattle on the farm as well. So they drink all the stillage from the still. They eat all the spent botanicals from the gin and the rum. So it's very much, it's a closed loop system. It's, it's um, yeah, it's good. It, and it's having the luxury of that much space on the farm, which is good. We've, we can run 40 cattle to drink all of our slops, <laughs> which is a very lucky lot, for. A whole lot of drunk cattle floating around the property. Is that what? I know. Everybody always asks that. And um, <laughs> <laughs> they, uh, 
they look very ha- fat and happy, but they're not drunk. Oh, good. <laughs> Unfortunately, yeah. <laughs> and Harriet, is your role in in the marketing and and um, distribution or? Yeah. So we did it when we first started because it was the Marpa and me business. We all did everything. Um, so. But now we've been able to hire a few more arms and legs. So now I do the stuff that I'm loving, which is the marketing. I love marketing and branding, storytelling, and um, also help out with the um, hospitality side of the business as well, which is great fun because I do love to eat and drink. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, we're going to have to go up there, Nige. Well, we are when, when we're, well, we can. Um, we can. Yeah. Yeah, I'd love to go back up there because, you know, as I say, I have sampled the uh, the product and Brad, if we go up, we'll have to spend a couple of days because it'll, you know, it'll be oh, a good trip. It's such a beautiful area. It, the Tweed is one of the most underrated places in Australia. It's mm. just gorgeous. I lived for Bris- in Brisbane for 11 years or so. Didn't even know the Tweed exists. Would drive straight through it to get to Byron Bay and it's just mm. stunning. We've got natural parks. We've got empty, gorgeous beaches. Mm. Yeah, you've got to get up here. And now we can travel in New South Wales. So please do it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Hey, I just want to um, just bring it back to the hand sanitizer because it, 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 just listening to you talk about it, it's almost, uh, in many ways, it's a social responsibility kind of action that you've taken. You saw the market need, the COVID going on. You guys went, well, we've got the capacity to help. So off you go, which is, um, business-wise, has it been good? Is it? I mean, I know you're going to go back to the rum side of things, but did you do it purely for the for the benefit of of society and the community and to help out with COVID, or was there a financial gain in it, some way, shape, or form? Yeah, um, or a bit of both, maybe. A bit of balance. both. Yeah, we definitely didn't know what it was going to be when we first started. When we started doing it, we were like, "Well, we'll just do this because we can do it," and we were filling to order, so the police wanted some, and you know, so we we're just doing it like that. Um, as it went on, it became really quite financially beneficial because there was just people wanted it so much and we were selling ours for for very cheap um like ten dollars a liter um and because and it kept all of our hands busy all our staff Mm. busy and because it was there was such a need for it and the financials were working for it it was um a fairly fairly affordable product for us to make we then could we had the opportunity to then start being quite philanthropic with it so donating 500 litres to the Royal Flying Doctor Service. And I think I think about 4% of our total sanitizer was donated. Um, and then we had another good chunk. I can't remember the exact percentage, but another good chunk of probably about 30, 30, 40% was 20% discounted to essential services and um, frontline workers, so schools and you know nurses and all those guys. So we were able to to distribute really, really affordable sanitizer, one of the cheapest on the market to people who needed it, which was great. Yeah, right. So because it was economically viable, that allowed mm-hmm. you then to become more philanthropic. Absolutely. Yeah. Wow. Mm-hmm. When you say keep it sorry, Brad, it kept hands busy. Was did it also give your guys a sense of purpose that they were contributing that COVID wasn't just about sitting around feeling sorry for yourself? It actually gave them something to hook onto, I suppose. Absolutely. We called it the Sunny game. We all got that Sunny game. It was just, it was madness. And it was really great because we could still engage with the community. Um, like our front of house team are used to seeing guests every day and having beautiful relationships with people in the, in the community. So taking them from that very social environment to like out the back bottling sanitizer for five days a week, they could then have that, you know, personal relationship with people coming through the drive through So that was good. If, even if it was like this, like tap here, please. <laughs> yeah. So it was great. It was good. Yeah. And it wasn't just us as well. There was lots of, lots of um, other distilleries were doing this as well. Um, and the government was really supportive of that. They just, like I said at the top, if you can make it, get it out there as fast as you can. So it was cool to see the ingenuity of, of our collective industry. I think it was, we, we were able to, move really fast on it so that was good yeah. they should have um like hand sanitizer awards like gin awards or something no there's an idea <laughs> that's an opportunity there's a pivot opportunity there is there is yeah you could and- taste them all you could test them all get them all up in the lineup <laughs> and do a bit of a fine testing well we you could can go back to focusing on on your gin and rum now yeah yeah so we have seen um and the 
the round table um, government group did tell us a little along. They said there is going to be a huge influx. So don't overcommit, don't overstock, don't invest financially in this because at one point there's going to be a flood of imports on the market, which we've now seen. So now you can buy sanitizer everywhere. It's all actually coming in from China mostly um, mm -hmm. with some domestic stuff being produced. Most of it's from China. Um, so it, it was, it's kind of like our heyday is now seen and gone. Um, mm -hmm. But we're, we're all collectively really glad that we could, could help out when, and it was, it's great. I think it's put the shine on Australian manufacturing as a whole. And mm -hmm. Australian manufacturing is good. It's Definitely. And, yeah. useful in pandemics. <laughs> Is the cellar door back open now? Or? Great. And and you can you can buy the hand sanitizer online, right? Still. Yeah, yeah, you can buy it online. Um, you can still buy it with our cellar door. And um, yeah, and our cellar door is open for 50 people. Actually, we can open up for more than that now, which is fantastic. But we're starting off with 50 this week. We all have to stand like this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Cheers like this. Cheers, like this. Yeah. Elbow <laughs> cheers. That'd be interesting. Yeah. Hey, um, thank you so much for your time. Oh, it's been it's been a really lovely chat. Oh, thanks so much for having me. What a way to start a Thursday morning. Yeah, cold <laughs> Thursday morning in the beautiful Tweed. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Thank you, Harriet. No pleasure. We'll see you up here soon then, Les. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> we'll, we'll shout you a drink. Oh, no, I'll shout you. I insist. I insist. Okay. Yeah, it was a leading comment. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, Harriet.